right, so today we have with us, through the Maine Humanities Council World in Your Library program, James Sparks, and he's going to be talking to us, sharing his knowledge about values and worldviews on nature and its uses. I'm going to hand it off to him. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. I hope everyone can see that. Is that okay? Good. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. I hope that uh, we can have what I would normally think of as a good conversation. Um, it may tend to be more me just talking and uh, I do want to encourage you if you have questions or comments to um, put those into the chat and Suzanne can kind of moderate that. And since everyone's muted, I can still see the screens over on, I have it set up uh, to see that. I'm just going to move that real quick. Um, but you know, if, if it seems urgent, maybe Suzanne, you can just kind of wave me into uh, a question and we can take it from there. Um, I've got a number of slides here set up uh, for us to look at and talk about and think about really. Um, so I will get started. Um, so values and worldviews on nature and its uses, right? I'm sure, um, we could all think about if we were asked, we could think about different ways people value nature, right? And I'm putting nature in quotes because people have different conceptions of what that means, right? Some people think of nature as just what's outside the window, what's out in the forest or in, uh, you know, what we would think of as undeveloped land. Other people might think of nature or the environment as uh, anywhere you are, right? Where we live, work, learn, and play. So in our homes, in our places of work, school buildings, as well as out in nature itself. Um, so my point is to try to help us think through the ideas of nature and how we use it as humans that challenge a little bit some of our um, kind of unreflected upon ways of thinking regarding nature or the environment. So I'm gonna move forward with my slides here. One of the foundational ways of, or, or frameworks of thinking that we can approach using this um, is, is systems thinking or, or um, well, what's generally called systems thinking, right? Which may be familiar to all of you systems thinking is really a generic framework for talking about systems. And systems can be all kinds. Um, your house, you know, where you live has an electrical system and a water system, right? Or a watershed has a water system or a system of trees and roots and fungus that are acting in symbiotic ways. Uh, any organ in your body, right? Like your liver, it's an independent thing that does its own part, but it's also nested within a larger context of activity. And so all systems have stocks, which is whatever that system is full of. Uh, so it could be blood, it could be electricity, it could be um, you know, energy transferred from the sun through photosynthesis. Um, and so that stock is generally has a flow, right? Where there's inputs and outputs within the system. And then often there are delays. Um, and these are just generic terms used in systems thinking that we can apply to various contexts. Uh, the couple of the key characteristics of any system is dynamic emergence, right? So things that are always changing and new contexts and, and combinations of elements are, are coming about through that change. It could be change that we see, like that is available to our level of human perception, or it could be super slow change, um, you know, like uh, rocks, like geological systems, right? Still constantly changing, but generally speaking, outside of the realm of human perception. Uh, and the other thing I want to kind of situate our thinking going into this discussion is thinking about scales of abstraction or layers of abstraction from global to local, right? So you've got these kind of huge, very, very abstract, generic kind of uh, considerations. 
all the way down to you know, our lived experience, uh, hyper-contextualized lived experience, right? And often we'll see problems that emerge when we compare systems across scales. And that starts to be very problematic, right? We can't generalize at the level of geological systems and have it be uh, completely valid in, you know, in the, the realm of our daily lives. So we wanna keep scale in mind when we're talking about either very particular or quite generic or abstract relationships. One element of systems thinking are the mental models that we develop over time. These are uh, you know, inherited through our, uh, not inherited in a genetic sense, but absorbed through social conditioning, where we live, where we grow up, who we live among, who, uh, what kind of cultures we were exposed to over time. And we create these mental models about how the world works. These are very influential, often very subconscious, right? They're acting in a way that is below our level of basic consciousness. Uh, most of our daily activity is guided by habit, right? So that's, again, these unreflected upon mental models at work. When we're talking about land use or nature or the environment, we have, we being, uh, I'm going to talk about we in this sense as, generally speaking, as Americans, right, as uh, Americans living in a capitalist colonial system that is uh, very heavily influenced by technology, right, um, these become, uh, what's the word, I want to say unreflected upon, but just sort of uh, habitual ways of thinking, right, and we can call this, these mental models, our worldview. And we get to the point often when you hear, you know, you listen to media, you listen to someone talk on the news, uh, they'll make references to this or that, us or them. Um, and it, it often makes really stark assumptions about who we're talking about and what kind of worldview we're coming at, uh, various problems and solutions. And that can be problematic, right? Because once we start talking within a specific worldview, we kind of by nature exclude other ways of thinking. We can look at that, uh, we, can, we can kind of talk about our modern day uh, lives as um, influenced by what have become traditional mental models of how we should use the land, how we should regard resources, where humans sit in the uh, level of relationships that are existing there. I have a picture here of some of my own uh, the, my, my ancestors who came from Norway to move to Minnesota in the late 19th century, the seated guy with the big beard is, would be my great, great grandfather. The man right behind him in the middle is, would be my great grandfather. And I put that in there because in the 1860s, you know, immigrants coming in from Norway or Germany or Sweden, this is in Minnesota again, um, right, had a certain set of affordances that were there and a certain worldview about how they were to use the land, right? The Homestead Act and other governmental or institutional structures allowed for these European and Scandinavian immigrants to come in as if this land were kind of virgin territory, right? Um, by 1864, pretty much all the Native Americans, which would be Ojibwe, Dakota, some Ho-Chunk or Chippewa or Winnebago, uh, those, those people were literally cleared off the land by that point, right? And so it did seem like it was just free and open to use, whereas people had actually been in this area for 12,000 years or so using the land, right? Harvesting resources, uh, using fire, using agriculture, other things um, that had been used, but then were systematically erased. Uh, so we'll come back to these kind of contrasting worldviews in a, in a minute, um, but they do guide how we've used land over the last century and a half or so. We can look at this contrast as kind of what I'm calling, and this is a, a big word, techno-scientific modernization, right? So 
highly, uh, you know, if we talk about agriculture, we'll talk about a lot of inputs regarding fertilizers, nitrogen and whatnot, um, where the, the soil becomes just an inert substance to hold roots together. It's not actually providing nutrients. We're, we're putting the nutrients on and also putting on, you know, herbicides and pesticides, um, better living through chemistry, right? That's kind of been our modern ethos here. And when it comes to land use since the 1950s or the post-World War II era, when we stopped using nitrogen to make bombs and we decided, oh, like we can put it on the land and then we've got, you know, three, four generations later, we've got a massive amount of monoculture corn and soybeans in the upper Midwest where that's just become the expected way of using the land, even though what it's causing downstream is a massive dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, right? Uh, taking out all the oxygen, uh, eutrophication. Um, that's problematic. If we want to think about regenerative land use over a long period of time, we want to think about other ways of using that land, right? So we can flip that around, and this is a bit of a dualism here, but these are polarities, not, not um, mutually exclusive, but overlapping in some ways. We can have a sense of ecological or eco-cultural awareness, right? Which is to say, we are all ecological beings us as humans, right? We are animals first before we are uh, split up into various essentially made up categories of race and culture and these other things. Um, but that often gets diminished or uh, erased in our modern use of language and uh, considerations for land use. Language is important. I'm gonna go back a little bit, uh, no. So um, language is important to me. I'm a communications person. That's where I come at this, uh, this from, although I'm in environmental communication. So I think about how we talk, how we use media, how we share information that informs our worldviews. So one way of talking about ecological relationships from the techno-scientific model is ecosystem services, right? It's a, it's a framework for thinking about land use that has become fairly accepted, uh, really quite robust, but also criticized by uh, various groups for being overly uh, reductivist, right? Meaning that we're, we're picking apart, this is what science does. It, it isolates a thing and then looks at that thing all by itself. That can be useful but it's also useful to look at the context, right? To look at the relational components of ecosystems uh, in order to get a better understanding of over time, how things might change for the better, for the worse. So I have a definition here of ecosystem services, which are ecological characteristics, functions, processes that either directly or indirectly contribute to human well-being, right? So we see a very anthropocentric framing of what ecosystems are for, right? The land in ecosystem services realms, uh, traditionally land, nature, or the environment is really for our human benefit, right? There's no, there's historically been very little consideration of the intrinsic value of, of nature or the environment, right? What does it mean to simply have land? Does land have rights, right? We're seeing a, a, a rights of nature movement come around where one avenue for protecting resources, ecosystems, is granting those rivers or mountains or trees or lakes some type of rights, right? People call them personhood rights. I don't I don't like that framing, but that's something you'll see. Like the people of Toledo, just a couple of years ago, granted Lake Erie personhood rights because through our legal mechanisms, that was a way for them to protect the agricultural runoff that was coming out of Northern Ohio and parts of Indiana uh, over in the West part of um, Ohio into Lake Erie, causing massive algal blooms and uh, people, you know, they were closing beaches uh, people couldn't use the resources, the, the drinking water systems were getting fouled up. Um, 
anyway, so there are <laughs> kind of getting off topic. Uh, there are ways that people are looking to value ecosystems differently than these traditional ecosystem services models. Okay, so after ecosystem services as a framework had been critiqued for quite a while from social scientists, humanists, ecological philosophers, um, there was uh, in the last decade or so, a movement towards understanding different types of ecosystem services, right? There are, uh, and people are probably familiar with this, right? There are provisioning services, there are regulating services, and there are what is called cultural ecosystem services, right? These are contr contributions to the non-material benefits that arise from the relationships of humans and ecosystems, which really, again, you know, we often wanna separate those two things, but the myth of separation is, I would say, part of our problem, right? That's why we can uh, despoil the land for short-term monetary gain without thinking about long-term benefits to not just ourselves, right? But to other parts of the ecosystems that some would argue have rights to exist on their own, different from anything that humans might get. So cultural ecosystem services, which are ways of understanding benefits. And I think of this in terms of art and writing. And uh, so you can think of painting, right? Uh, writing, songs, music um, from not just Western perspectives, but indigenous perspectives as well, right? That we tell stories about our relationships with nature that help us understand not only ourselves, but ourselves within a context of something greater than ourselves not necessarily a divine presence, but you could go that far, but just simply being a, a reversal of the anthropocentrism that we often see in the language of science or techno-scientific modernization. So cultural ecosystem services was a framework developed and that has since turned into what folks are now calling nature's contributions to people, which still my critique is that that's still a very anthropocentric framing. Um, and you'll see, I think you can see um, it, uh, I, I, it's covered by my video part, but I think I have Diaz et al. Uh, science 2018. That science article from Sandra Diaz was really, it really helped me. It kind of changed the color of the sky in, in terms of my own thinking about how these relationships are valued from not just scientists, right? Not just Western scientists, like Euro-American scientists, but other people's valuations of nature and its relationships to humans and other animals. It, it really makes room for that, right? So the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystems, or IPBES, I think some people refer to it as IPIS, um, takes this a step further and they start to think of a wider range of stakeholders that from, you know, so it's not again mutually exclusive, but it goes from the range of scientists doing ecological work or biological work or other kind of ecosystems work to local and indigenous perspectives that are valuable if we're talking about biodiversity as a thing that we want to maintain and not just maintain but to actually increase right the if we look at the amazon one of the few and shrinking remaining mega biodiverse ecosystems in the world much of that land is still controlled or influenced by the indigenous people of that area who do not necessarily think about relationships in the western scientific framework Right, but Western scientists come into those areas and want to work with those folks, but we're not speaking the same language, right? And so this way of uh, this framework, this nature's contributions to people, and I'm going to go into some uh, visual demonstrations of those differences 
um, can help us understand and work with local and indigenous populations on a global level, as well as maybe help us understand even how our local indigenous people, so here in Maine, right, people of the Wabanaki Confederacy, might be thinking about these ecological relationships differently. And again, not mutually exclusive, right, but differently. If you've read uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass, you see a really good example of not either or, but a both and reanimation of the scientific world, right? So she's using, Kimmerer is using language of science, because that's her training, as well as language of her people, the Potawatomi Nation, or the uh, broadly speaking Anishinaabe, um, to understand her relationships to the world, right? And again, not mutually exclusive, but that combination of views adds to a much more robust and richer way of thinking about those relationships. I'm checking the time to make sure I don't go too slow here. So this nature's contributions to people framework uh, tries to take in a whole systems approach um, that, that overcomes some of the limitations that we've seen in the past. And these can include, can include beneficial things, talking about water purification or artistic inspiration, as well as detrimental aspects to a system, right? Uh, vectors of disease being uh, transported through uh, climate change, right? We're seeing different ticks in Maine. We're seeing Zika virus expand into Florida or other places, right? We're seeing um, change of ecosystems uh, essentially caused by human activity over the past century or so um, shift in what we normally thought was useful or good um, and into other relationships. I kind of lost my train of thought there and I apologize. I'm going to move ahead to this slide, which gives us this um, both and perspective, right? And I'm going to just one second, I'm going to move this so that I can see my slides better. And then I'm going to go back to this. So in the, and again, this was out of the Diaz et al paper. This was in science. This is available for people to see. Uh, if you look at, I have a list of sources at the end of this slide uh, presentation so you can see them. But this is, I thought was a good visual representation of the interaction between what we would think of as the Western scientific model, which is the generalizing perspective, right? Where we like to look at everything in the abstract and apply abstract principles to scientific understandings of the world versus, or not versus, I'm sorry, uh, or an enhancement of the context specific perspective, which would take local and or indigenous perspectives into account as a way to explain relationships between uh, elements of nature, including humans over time. Uh, generally speaking, as you're all familiar with the generalizing perspective, perspective tends to look at humans and nature as separate rather than intricately combined. Right? The context specific is a much richer way of thinking about it that looks at kinship ties, recipro reciprocal obligations uh, that we have. You know, nature can provide us with resources, but we have to tend to it. Right? We have to take care of it. And in the techno-scientific view, nature is there for us to just take, take, take. Right? And uh, we are not encouraged at all to think about what it takes to build our cars or our homes, or, you know, I just bought a brand new laptop. What did it take to build? Where do all these precious metals come from, right? They come from somewhere. But in a consumer society, we're not supposed to think about that. That would slow down our consumerist tendencies, right? Um, but that's what's gotten us into a whole lot of problems relative to the global climate catastrophes that are showing up uh, in various ways at various times. Um, we need to find better ways to have a relationship with slash in nature. 
So this is uh, what I'm trying to get to is a sense of rather than just economic valuation, which is the tendency for us to talk about nature, right? If you hear, if you tune in in any media channel and they're talking about, um, I don't know, whatever, land use, right? Almost always, the only way that it's referred to is in terms of dollars, right? A forest is worth this much money if we cut down all the trees and sell them off, right? A uh, lakefront is worth this much money if we parcel it out and sell it off to individual homeowners, right? Um, a fishery in the Gulf is worth X amount of dollars to the, the fishermen, the, the people who buy and sell goods, right? That economic valuation is important, but it is not the only way to think about things, right? So here in this diagram on the left, you see the kind of economic dominated valuation, which is to say a singular worldview that has become so hegemonic in our society that it actively kind of excludes everything else. We're not encouraged to think about other ways of valuing nature for not just our uses, but for itself uh, as an intrinsic value. So I know some of this print is a little bit small, but you see on the right-hand side, this approach to pluralistic valuation, which includes a diversity of worldviews. We can take into account values or valuations that are much more holistic, right? Which is to say uh, contextualized, right? In biophysical and sociocultural components, what they add to in terms of the health of the land, the air, the water, life itself, right, as well as economic values. I'm not here to say that economic valuation is not good or bad. I'm here to say, yes, okay. And let's look at see some of these other ways to value what's going on with our relationship to nature. The key to pluralistic valuations, and this is, um, I'll get the reference in the next slide, an uh, uh, article that was, in, I believe, was in Current Issues and Sustainability. Um, I'll have to double check that. The key to this pluralistic valuation are considering relational values, right? If we're going to really approach stewardship from a transformational perspective, we need to understand not just the intrinsic value of nature outside of human uses, and instrumental valuation of nature, which is to say, generally speaking, economic valuation, but relational values bring those together and help. And that's, I would generally say in the stories we tell about nature, you know, it is the relational values that come to the fore, right? It's the time spent with people that we care about. It's time spent uh, reflecting alone for ourselves it, and absorbing and being part of a world greater than ourselves that we come to appreciate those relationships in uh, more depth. Using uh, relational values in this way can help interdisciplinary discussions, right? It can help us bridge the siloed kind of approach to science that, uh, you know, the ivory tower kind of academic world tends to look at only things happening within one's discipline rather than cross-disciplinary work. It's becoming more common, but it's still got a long way to go, as well as getting out of that academic realm and into real world applications. So here is a demonstration of the, the th three different kinds of valuation, right? So we've got instrumental, which is what we almost always only hear about, right? These are market values or preferences of economic valuation. Those are generally substitutable. If we, if we can't get trees from this plot of land, well, we can go over and get trees over here. If we, can't, if we can't use pine, then we'll use spruce, right? Those are kind of substitutable valuations of the almost the industrial model, right? Uh, if you can't get a supply of nuts and bolts from this supplier, you're going to go over here and get it from these people. Right? So those are substitutable things. Non-substitutable values are those relational components, which 
can help us lead to what we would think of as the good life or a good way of living. And I'm gonna slight diversion here. If you look at the constitution of Ecuador, you will see a preference towards uh, living well as a foundational framework for that constitution. It was rewritten in 2008, I wanna say. Now, whether or not people have been living up to the ideals of the Constitution of Ecuador is a totally different topic. Uh, they have not. Um, but the, the, if, you, if you take the time to read the Constitution of Bolivia or Ecuador, you will see language that, from an American perspective, honestly, is incredible. Like, we would, we would never have that kind of nature-centric ecological awareness in a government document like that, uh, historically. Uh, it's very, very interesting, the way that they're using language. Anyway, back to this, uh, this relational valuation, right? Uh, these are just three ways of looking at value. And you'll see that the, the value space, the, the false thing, is not completely filled with these three valuations, which is to say that there is room for other values that, these are, that are beyond these three, but these three tend to encompass a lot of, and probably most of what um, most people think of when they think about valuations, if they're gonna stretch beyond just instrumental value. Okay, so I'm almost done talking and then I'd like to open it up for some questions and I'll try to field those questions or um, maybe, you know, some of you can answer other questions and we can have a discussion. That'd be great. Um, pluralistic valuation, which is a broadening of our understanding. And I'm speaking, when I say our, I'm, I'm talking about us as Americans, right? We almost, almost, almost always only think about value of nature or land use or the environment in terms of economic values, when we hear it talked about in broad discourse. Yet when it comes down to our individual lives, what we think about when we think about nature, right? If you're out on a, a kayak tour, if you're on a, a fishing trip, if you're out hiking in the woods, you're feeling it differently, right? There is aesthetic value. There is a sense of peace perhaps, or, or at oneness with nature, right? These are other ways of valuing nature and the environment that we should be talking about, right? Rather than just letting the baseline of discourse be simply economics, right? We're in, in I'm, I don't think I'm gonna get political here, but um, you know, this whole coronavirus pandemic, for quite a long time, the framing of it was economics, right? We need to get the country back to work. We need to get the economic engine of the country working. No, right? it's a public health thing. Right? It's a public health conversation, but we're talking about it in economics because uh, most of our leaders across the aisles uh, really only talk about economics as a, as a point of valuation, when we should and can be talking about wider values that really matter to people's lives. Anyway, getting back to this. Across global perspectives, if we take a pluralism of valuations, we're gonna include more people in the conversation and we can have broader and more in-depth policy and practice conversations if we're gonna be more inclusive, particularly if we're talking about trying to protect mega biodiverse or even moderately biodiverse areas, right? We wanna talk about shared values. It's really powerful if you can get, you know, a conservative, person who is, you know, living out West, and I'm thinking of my dad here, right? Likes to go hunting and fishing, not into all that liberal stuff, uh, but they care about land use. They care about water quality. They care about good habitat. That starts to sound an awful lot like an environmentalist would talk, right? So we can come at protecting ecosystems from a point of shared values. And I think that's really a powerful potential for conversations in the future and now to, to focus on shared values rather than um, 
some of the divisive language that we hear often. If we can address and incorporate these broader perspectives, we also then are going to, I would say, hope to see a greater sense of justice, fairness across demographics and equity. And these, those are things that align with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which we, I would hope, you know, in the future, we're gonna see more of our policy towards land use, nature and the environment, tied to global perspectives on sustainable development. Now, we could debate sustainable development and what that means and, and some of the policy critiques there, there's plenty to do. Um, that's not our role, but I think the more we start to have that conversation at a global level, the better. We can take it then to our context-rich perspectives of our own lives and have a more robust conversation uh, across and based on those shared values. So my summary is I will encourage folks to think about systems, a framework of thinking, systems, this is Donella Meadows, I'm sure most of you are familiar with systems thinking or have heard of the phrase maybe. Uh, it's a useful framework to thinking about comparisons across scales of abstraction, right? From context rich particularity to generic kind of uh, layers of abstraction of economics and sociology and psychology and geography and those kinds of fields, right? Uh, and to watch your language, right? The, the language of pluralism is a contrast to reductive dualisms, right? We're really often led into discussions that are, that are dualistic in, in our society. And I, I want to see, and I want to encourage people to talk in, in multiplicities and the, the complexity of the actually existing world rather than these reductive dualisms, right? Us and them, those kinds of conversations. If we can recognize relational and intrinsic valuations, that offers a counterweight to the economics only kind of conversation that we tend to have in our society. So that is the basis of my introduction to pluralistic valuation through relational values and how that might relate to land use or nature and in the environment uh, in our lives. I would like you to think about, if you have questions, think about how some of this might, because this a lot of this is generic language, how might this show up in your everyday life, in your context-rich perspective, right, of, of your local and everyday life? Um, I'm gonna switch back here so that I can see people. Um, and I'm gonna broaden my screen. Only uh, Vicki has her camera on and hi Vicki um, and Suzanne. Thank you for hosting. Um, let me see if I can get the chat thing. Yeah, back. so so James, thank you so much. And um, I did have a couple questions privately chatted to me. <laughs> so you, you won't be able to see them, but um, okay. the first one is from Nick and he said, um, do you think that a Western worldview, which often divides the world into dichotomies, contributes to the wrong interpretation of nature and humans as separate, and that Eastern and indigenous worldviews may have a less anthropocentric frame? Uh, okay, so it seems like two questions there. I would say yes to the first one, which is to say that the Western language of modernity, right, our modern times, um, absolutely separates or tries to pretend that humans and nature are separate. Because when we think of ourselves as above nature, it's much easier to destroy it, right? It's much easier to just take, take, take when we don't have to think of it as part of our life, right? Um, my, I, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and, and really studying, 
right? Reading and listening to other people from other places in the world. And, and Robin Wall Kimmerer says this too, right? When we have an animate view of nature, which is to say, generally speaking, uh, an indigenous perspective that, that elements of life are waterways, are forests, right? The air. We have an ancestral view that looks at not just people as our relationships or kin, but all types of life. It's a lot harder to destroy that if we think of it as related to us, as a kinship network, right? And so the language that brings us together is going to facilitate I guess for lack of a better phrase, a sense of caring, like the language that we tend to use now, right? Techno-scientific language really does separate and makes it much easier to just run roughshod over it, right? And we can mine and, and you know, farm fence row to fence row monocrops in the upper Midwest, which I've seen my whole life, um, without without real care towards what what goes downstream. But you know, when we start to think that we're all downstream from somewhere else, then maybe we start to make those connections a little bit more uh, personally. Did that answer the question? And Nick, feel free to take yourself off of um, mute if you, if that didn't answer your question. Yes. Um, Nick also had another question. Um, how does one speak about valuations, especially plural, pluralistic ones, and yet still avoid money, but isn't dividing up thought into Eastern slash indigenous versus Western also dualistic? Um, so again, two questions. Um, I. I think Eastern Western is an oversimplification and a reduction of, of the complexity of the relationships. I think we could think about, uh, you know, in, in our society or in, in the North South America, North Central and South America, indigenous versus colonized or colonizer relationships. Um, you know, it's not to say that there aren't polarities that are simple to use and help us that can be effective like day and night right? Day and night exist as two different things, but there's also dusk and dawn, right? So there are transitional points of relationship. Um, so yes, dualisms can be helpful, but I think the unreflected upon dualistic thinking is more detrimental than helpful. Uh, to the first point, I, if I'm remembering the question right, uh, you know, money does matter. Like, it, it's not like money doesn't matter that we can't talk about economics. But when that becomes the only lens of valuation that you're using day after day after day, year after year, generation after generation, that obscures and erases these other relational components, right? And honestly, the intrinsic value, our sense of the intrinsic value of nature, right? Which if we could bring that back in to our conversations alongside relational, economic, and intrinsic values, that adds a much more nuanced set of contexts into the conversation that I think is more reflective of the complexity of the actually existing world. Um, thank you. And Vicki, has questions here. Um, can you talk a little more about the personhood of a part of nature, such as a lake? I find this quite interesting. Did the courts accept this concept of personhood? Yeah, um, that, that word is, is uh, problematic, I'll say. I don't like, I, I use it because people have a sense of what it is, uh, but I don't, it, it's not that we're seeing the lake as a person although there are some perspectives, some worldviews that would look at lakes, forests, trees, rocks, right? The, the, the full breadth of the world around us as part of our kinship ties. 
um, in our society, right? And I'll use the Toledo example again, uh, the legal mechanisms of the city of Toledo, the citizens granting personhood rights, right? Or uh, if, you, if you Google rights of nature as a phrase, you'll find a lot on this right now. It's very, very interesting and is being used in a strategic and legal way to grant protection against ecological threats. And so that is one kind of um, inventive way of using established legal channels to protect the things that we care about, which in that case is Lake Erie, right? They couldn't seem to halt the over, um, you know, this is the upper Midwest, right? So there's lots of corn and soybeans. So they're dumping nitrogen, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides on the land. And of course it's, you know, it rains then and it all washes out into the lake. And then they have a huge um, over fertilized basically. And they get these algal blooms, which suck up all the oxygen and all the fish die. And then you've got fish washing up on the shore, right? They, it, it's hard to stop individual farmers from doing those things. But at a systems level, they found one mechanism through the legal channels was to grant the lake some sense of intrinsic rights. And so that we see that there are forests uh, and rivers in New Zealand where this has happened a few times. And, and it's, I'd say over the last five years, this has become more and more, I mean, it's not like super common at this point, but it's becoming more and more common globally as a mechanism, a legal mechanism towards protection when other mechanisms, right? Like protesting in the streets and trying to elect the right leaders, right? Those things don't always work well through the legal mechanisms of uh, rights of nature. We start to see that being somewhat more effective, which is, I think, just super interesting, both in a language way and in a kind of a legal precedent. Don't have any other questions right now, but um, folks, again, there's there's so few of us. You can unmute yourself if you have one, or the chat box, whichever you prefer. Oh, um, let me go. I can't. Here we go. I'm going to bring up my, so I, I think you can see these. These are some of the resources that I used um, in developing my thoughts on these things. So you see the Diaz et al. from science. That should be accessible to people without, you don't need to have a, um, you know, a, a, a subscription to science to be able to read that. And that's got it's got like, it's really short, it's two pages, but then it's got like 15 pages of addendums. So pretty interesting, accessible if you want it to be, but also more in depth if you want it to be. Um, and then the, that IPBS, Contrasting Approaches to Values and Valuation, is a, I think a really good and again, accessible way uh, that those folks have put together very similar thoughts to what I've been talking about today here. The Himes and Maraca piece from 2018, Relational Values, that was very influential in my thinking uh, as a way to expand and bring together both kind of techno-scientific language and you know, local and indigenous perspectives in a mutually beneficial way um, for moving forward. And before anyone else logs off, I just want to say thank you for sitting in and, and um, listening and asking questions. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. This isn't, I've, um, I've taught, I've co-taught a forest and society course for the past three years. Uh, and this, that, that is the venue that I've mostly developed this thinking about, as well as two co-authored pieces uh, with an anthropology colleague who did his field work in Highland Ecuador, and that forced me into really trying to understand, uh, you know, a place I'd never been to and a worldview that I haven't had personal experience with, but looking at the constitution of Ecuador and Bolivia um, and how indigenous people there 
you know, they're, they're, they're in a pluralistic universe, right? They're living as indigenous people. They're living as citizens of the state of Ecuador. They're living in, as a residents of a, a nature preserve, right? So there, there are multiple kind of identities and um, functioning relationships they have to other people, to the state, and to nature itself. It's very, very, for me, very, very interesting. And I'll just say thank you again, Suzanne, for hosting and kind of fielding questions. And um, I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we've had a few folks jump off and, and they've expressed their gratitude as well. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any last minute questions from anyone in the group? Hey, Suzanne, it's Karen. I do have a question, if you don't mind, if you have yeah. a few more minutes. Yep. Hi, so my, I'm, I'm Karen, I work with Suzanne here at the Reserve, um, and I wanted to let everyone else ask their questions, but um, I'm currently in a grad program that's talking a lot about inquiry and sense of place and how people relate to nature, so I feel like this is perfect, and actually your resources are going to be wonderful um, to be able to read and delve into, Great. but I'm thinking of creating, we have a lot of just self-guided visitors, people who come here maybe once, maybe twice, um, or maybe regularly on their walks. And so I'm thinking about putting up some sort of self-guided signs, not big interpretive signs, but signs that maybe switch out each season. And the goal of those might be to have quotes or a question or a prompt that perhaps creates a, more of a, a deeper sense of place. And I'm wondering what your thoughts on maybe what might be good directions to go in for something like that would be. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, what comes to mind when you're talking about what sound like prompts, right, as, as a way to prompt um, reflection. Um, one, of the, one of the best classes I taught uh, was last spring, and it was an eco-musicology course. Not totally related to what we've been talking about here, but the foundational point of that class was to help students tune in to their listening in a, in, a, in a way that enhanced their sense of contextualized space. And so if you have prompts that cue up certain perceptual uh, uh, orientations, right? We're so visual, we're, we're, we're visual and we're auditory. We're not always good listeners. We don't always smell what we're around, but those perceptual nudges can really help people refocus and reorient themselves within the the place where they're at right because if we think of sense of place as you probably know it's it's like generic geographical space imbued with meaning and so you're trying to enhance or or cue up or nudge people towards um a, a greater depth of meaning relative to where they are geographically um, that comes through experience, that comes through a sense of identity, right? So place identity is obviously very, very well um, documented construct, uh, both from the psycho social psychological side, as well as the uh, phenomenological side. Um, very, very interesting. Uh, and I'd, I'd be willing to share, I got, I've got a folder, a digital folder of, you know, of this many uh, sense of place, place identity, place dependence, um, place attachments, those kinds of references. Many of them are probably from 15 years ago when I was a grad student, and that was one of my really strong interest areas as well. So if I go back to this slide, you'll see my email, uh, jtsparts at gmail right there. And that uh, at JT is my Twitter account, which uh, you know I'm on there often enough too. So feel free to reach out. Um, and we're almost done here and, and there's a lot to talk about in that way, but feel free, really. Yeah, thank you, James, that's wonderful. I probably will, I would love a, a wealth of resources. <laughs> Great. Appreciate did it. Did I answer your question? Did, did, do you think those kind of prompts would work if you kind of ask people to just stop and, and have us, you know, take 10 breaths or take five breaths and listen, right? That's really super simple, but it, it it knocks us out of our standard kind of, you know, plugged in and um, 
our busy minds, right? It helps us slow down to the actual pace of the actual existing world. When we start listening to birds and hearing the wind, right? That slows us down in our kind of overstimulated society. I think anything we can do to help us kind of just slow down a little bit. And that's why people go to, to, to natural preserves, right? And people go to parks to sort of, it helps us de-stress. If you can look at the whole, you know, literature of um, forest bathing and uh, Florence Williams has a book called The Nature Fix, right? Where she went all over the world and looked at kind of basically forest bathing type things. Uh, very scientific as well as very kind of humanistic elements to those um, components of helping us connect with place in a deeper way. Yeah, no, you definitely, you definitely helped move me along the path and actually gave a little validation of, I'm just like you're talking about, it's um, in my mind, that was kind of where I was going, like some sensory prompts and things like that. But like you said, sometimes that feels so simple and you feel like, oh, I need to do more. But no, that's actually what we need to be doing is a little bit less and, and focusing on some of that quieter stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, or even, you know, having little notebooks and people just jot down thoughts or, or have a notebook at the stand. I, I don't know. There's different ways to do it. Um, some are more, you know, have more upkeep over time. And if you, you don't want to have too much signage out in, out in the field, right? You don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, there's trade-offs. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I appreciate your thoughts. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. Thank you for asking. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. I know you have a lot going on right now. So really appreciate it.